we can start, Spencer, because uh, I guess you have so many speakers that uh, we might, yeah. Uh, what do you think? Sounds great. We're already on recording now. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Quentin Wodan. Uh, I'm a Rotarian from Washington, D.C. And uh, Spencer asked me for two or three minutes to introduce uh, this uh, webinar. Um, the Brains uh, BR, the webinar, are going to be the speaker, and Spencer did all the, all the organization. Um, somebody is actually talking, and you might want to mute yourself. Uh, the title is Amphibious Housing for Vulnerable Communities, and we are going to learn about uh, innovative uh, programs to try to help um, people um, who are victims of floods uh, in Bangladesh and in Vietnam um, try to cope and how to protect housing. housing. The webinar is uh, co-sponsored by the Rotary Peace Fellowship Association, the Rotary Club of Washington Global, the Fellowship for Global Development, the RAG on Refugees, and importantly, uh, the Global Resilience Partnership. And I'll just say one more word. Um, a few years ago, I did um, a study for the World Bank um, on South Asia on how uh, people were affected by floods. And, and one of the conclusions that we had from that study is that it was actually very difficult for the, the most poor people who were affected by flood uh, to leave, to migrate. Um, and um, this is not directly about this, but it really tries to solve um, a, a very complex issue. So without um, additional um, uh, taking time, uh, Spencer, uh, the floor is back to you for uh, the host of the event. Thank you, Quentin. Um, the, um, the rundown of the event will be, uh, we have Douglas and um, Andrew here be the facilitating the whole event. What we shall do is we're gonna start the event with the, uh, with the document, uh, documentary films. And after that, we have um, a panel, panelists uh, in discussion on this area. And together at this event, we have the, um, the CEO of the Global Resilience Partnership, Nate here as well. Um, we have a person, um, Elizabeth uh, Douglas and Nathan and Tang in here. I mean, they're all experts in this area. So please feel free to um, put your, any questions you want to raise on the chat and maybe we can address it after the panel discussions. Um, on this note in here, the, um, Shall I pass the, um, the floor to um, Douglas? Yeah, hi everybody. Um, my name is Douglas Varshall. I'm the, uh, I, I guess you would call the resident filmmaker for this, um, for these guys that were, that were uh, Elizabeth and Nandan for, for this, these wonderful projects of theirs. And um, the, what you're going to see is uh, we've got a 16 minute piece that we shot about two years ago and we're gonna sort of show that up first. And then uh, Elizabeth and Nandan will explain where their projects are today. Um, and at this point, I wanna bring in Andy. Andy, why don't you, um, Andy and I uh, are co-hosting. Andy, are you there? Andy Stone. Yes, yes I am, Douglas. Area. Okay, hi. I'm a Rotary, I'm a Rotary okay. Peace Fellow, thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Andy is a Rotary Peace Fellow. Um, so at this point, um, is there anything that you want to say, Andy, about uh, the Rotary Peace Fellow and how this whole project of these, these two projects sort of relate to the work that you're doing? Like a minute, two minutes? Certainly. Why is this, why is this important for you? Yeah. Uh, uh, as Rotary Peace Fellows, we are we come together from a wide range of of sectors and disciplines, and uh, my work is my work as a peace fellow is in the Mekong River Basin, about fifty percent of it. So I'm, I'm I'm aware of the issues in the with the Mekong Delta, and with changes in climate, and also uh, changes in the Upper River in recent years with uh, large hydropower dam projects and and other types of development. Um, in the upper basin, there, there's gonna be some dramatic changes uh, to the Delta in the next 50 to 100 years. That's affecting somewhere between 15 and 20 million people and the majority of the agricultural production uh, of Vietnam. So it's, it's a very timely and relevant issue where you're, you're almost next door to Myanmar, which is currently undergoing some political um, strife, I guess we could say. And, and you're also adjacent to the South China Sea. So it's really at the center of a lot of geopolitical issues that we're going to be seeing in the next uh, couple of decades. Okay, great. Um, 
Well, I think at this point, let's bring on uh, uh, the CEO of Global Resilience Partnership, and that's um, Nate Matthews. And he basically is the, um, uh, Nate's organization was the funding organization for these two projects. So, so, so Nate, why don't you explain GRP and uh, why you chose these two projects to uh, get funding? Sure, thanks, Doug, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. I'm, I'm really excited to uh, to hear more and some from these projects and some updates from everyone. So, just a very brief introduction. Global Resilience Partnership. We're a partnership of over 60 public and private organizations working on building resilience in low and middle income countries. Um, we work across four interlinked areas, and they're usefully defined as innovate, share, convene, and advance. And the work in our innovation. Um, sphere is the work that we funded under this project. And that really is focused on, on how we surface innovation on the ground. And as you know, when, you, when you're searching for innovation, you, you, have to, you have to take risks to get to innovation. And when you take risks, you have to really have an adaptive learning approach and really embrace the idea that failure is a possibility. When we, when we supported these projects, they were supported through a, a $10 million investment from Zurich Insurance that was looking at building flood resilience um, in, in low and middle income countries. And this was uh, about four years ago now. And we supported the projects along with a sort of a wider ecosystem of support. And we, we selected these projects also because they weren't looking, although the, the title of this project is really about amphibious housing, to, to identify these projects as just a singular solution on amphibious housing would be uh, a misrepresentation of the projects because they also came with their own engagement, uh, a long and deep engagement with communities, um, background work, um, working with uh, you know, a wider ecosystem of support and links up to policy influence and capacity development. And I think that's, that's really important to think about when we think about resilience projects because resilience for us is really about how to find ways to thrive in the face of uncertainty and, and be transformative in the face of uncertainty and, and find these sort of novel ways of managing our livelihoods, novel ways of stewarding our ecosystems. And these projects were exceptionally innovative. They have lots of adaptive learning from this. And both um, Nandan, uh, who I will introduce properly in a second, and Elizabeth have, have really taken, uh, you know, I think the learning from this project and been able to amplify that across their respective works since. And, and also they brought so much with them, so much learning and innovation with them to the Global Resilience Partnership that we felt very lucky to be able to support them in this work and, and learn from them uh, ourselves. So I won't add on much more there. I would just add just another couple words on flooding um, to complement what uh, Andy was saying and um, as well what uh, Quinton was saying. So flooding as a, as a topic is, is really critical at the moment. So by 2030, an additional 800 million people will be at risk of coastal flooding. Um, and it's also really important to recognize that flooding is not gender neutral. So women are most adversely impacted both during floods and after floods. And of course, vulnerable groups are, are much more significantly impacted by, um, by flooding than others. Those are really important topics that Elizabeth and Nandan are addressing um, and, and in really challenging contexts as well. Uh, so it's great to see these innovations from these projects being showcased and um, and I really look forward to hearing the updates. So Doug, should I go ahead and introduce Elizabeth and, and Nanda now, or is that over to someone else? No, go ahead and in, uh, go ahead and introduce them, please, by all Great. means. So uh, Nandan uh, uh, Muhajer is um, the, let's see if I can get his correct title here. He's the postdoctoral um, research fellow at the University of Dundee, which is a UNESCO Center for Water Policy and Law. And um, so we're very excited to have Nandan here. And he's got a, a long uh, history in uh, engineering, business, and geography, and been working in nature-based solutions for over 20 years. And Elizabeth, Professor English, I should say, is a professor at the University of Waterloo, uh, who has uh, originally from Louisiana. Is, it, is that where you're originally from? 
I, I think so. Unmute okay. yourself, Elizabeth. Yes, I'm trying to. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually <laughs> originally from New Jersey, but I've been in Louisiana <laughs> for 21 years, and I've been teaching at the University of Waterloo in Canada uh, for 13 years, 14 years. Great, but it's fantastic. Thanks, Elizabeth. And it's really that experience, you know, living in Louisiana and really seeing the the, the power and devastating uh, destructive uh, force of floods firsthand that uh, that brought you into this. And I know you were originally looking at at wind, I think originally, and then you you moved on to look at how um, how flooding um, impacts houses and things like that. So you can tell that story as you get into your talk. But as I said, that should be enough of an introduction and, and really excited to hear from you. And uh, we also have uh, Lu Tiang um, with, and Lu, you have to uh, help me out here a bit with your organization. Tang, can you explain who you're with and unmute, your, unmute yourself? Go ahead. Uh, hello, thank you so much. Um, so I am working as a researcher for Center of Water Management and Climate Change at Vietnam National University. So I have been working uh, uh, in this organization for about three years and mostly based on the Mekong Delta of Vietnam. My research interests uh, are on uh, water governance, uh, um, livelihood transformation, and climate change adaptation. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Back over to you, Doug. OK. Um, Nanda, did you want to mention anything? Two seconds? Not You have to un unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, I'm fine for now. Just. Um, Again, uh, oh, no. the, sorry for that. Uh, one of the uh, one of the issues that uh, one of the lessons that we have been learning over the last few years is sustainable living is the most important uh, uh, learning that we have to pursue in the coming days. And these houses that we are designing don't. Um, uh, think that these are just floating houses. These are the example how people can live sustainably. I'll, I'll cover this more in the, uh, in the coming um, sessions, but uh, just now, yeah. Okay, thank you, Nandan. Uh, Spencer, at this point, let's, uh, let's show uh, a 16 minute film that, that looks at, it's a documentary of these two projects uh, in the context of uh, GRP. Uh, can you roll? Okay, thank you. Flooding is essential for the ecosystem health of a delta. Although traditional delta homes are usually raised above the ground, climate change projections suggest the world's deltas will be prone to increasingly severe floods in the future. With support from the Zed Zurich Foundation, the Global Resilience Partnership Water Window Challenge awarded 12 grants to find innovative solutions to building sustainable flood resilience in challenging environments. This film follows two of the GRP Water Window grantees, one in Vietnam and one in Bangladesh, working to retrofit and build low-cost, floating homes for marginalized people in flood-prone areas. The major new design element includes adding a buoyancy component to the house so that it floats during a flood, allowing the occupants to persist, adapt, and transform in the face of flooding instead of moving away. The data from the pilot projects will be used to scale up and form sustainable business models for propagating the housing design and overall adaptation strategy throughout the region and beyond. Two, four, six, eight. 
We should all amphibiate. The Mekong Delta is home to over 17 million people, most of whom are rice and fish farmers. It's composed largely of wetlands, and its annual flood season is now under threat from climate change, sea level rise, and changes to the Mekong River from upstream hydropower, which will likely cause greater disruption for Delta communities in the future. Resilience for me means helping a community prepare in advance for a hazardous event so that it doesn't become a disaster. And if there is damage or hardship, they can recover much more quickly and resume their normal lives. I'm interested in reducing trauma, in reducing displacement, because I saw so much of that after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, and it was personally very upsetting for me. Elizabeth and her team are here to collaborate with Vietnamese partners to develop techniques for retrofitting houses so they are better able to survive the anticipated extreme floods and rains of the future. Theo cái đề án nhà nổi có thể làm cho người dân an tâm hơn. Thì hơn nữa là người dân khi có lũ về người dân cùng sống chung với lũ, người dân cùng sống chung với lũ. Tại vì khi sống chung với lũ thì có thể kinh tế tạo ra trong mùa lũ cho người dân. Transformation in the face of extreme flooding is key to building resilience. By turning traditional Delta homes into clever amphibious creatures, people can go beyond just coping to actively shaping change. This is a typical Vietnamese house. We retrofitted it to become amphibious. When the flood comes, it will lift up off the ground, buoyed up by these empty recycled jugs, and the rope will slide up on the vertical guidance post and it'll stay on top of the water. As the flood goes away, it will come back down and end up in exactly the same position as when it took off. To help with the retrofits, Elizabeth collaborated with a local master carpenter. <laughs> There were many challenges the team faced, including developing a centering device that ensures the house comes down in the same position it started after the water recedes, and coming up with the guidepost system that keeps the house from floating away. So what we're doing here is merging latest scientific approaches and methods of calculation with the traditional way of making houses and coming up with a synthesis that respects the local culture but is calculated to make sure that what we're doing is safe and well engineered by modern standards. One customer is very satisfied with the result of their amphibiated retrofit. During the past 12 months, four Delta homes were amphibiated. As each house was structurally unique, the team was able to experiment with the basic components of the retrofit, trying out new designs. Sensors were also installed to monitor tilt, roll, and wind speed. Now we need to wait for the floods to come so that we can show how well they perform or find that they don't perform as well as we were hoping and make changes to the design. Cũng là mới mẹ mới lần đầu tiên mình thấy vậy là cũng rất là hài lòng. 
và có thể là sau này mình có mần thêm có thể mình rút ra nhiều cái kỹ thuật khác hơn có thể là chắc chắn hơn nữa. The local government is also pleased, though how the houses behave when water is added is a key point for them. Thì uh, nếu những năm tới lũ về thì có thể là xem lại cái mô hình nhà này, người dân sống trong cái ngôi nhà này thì như thế nào thì lúc đó cái cái hiệu quả ra sao thì lúc đó địa phương sẽ xin ý kiến của ủy ban huyện thì lúc đó mới mở rộng ra được. The beauty of an amphibiated house is that it targets the roots of the problem of living with floods, not by building dams or dikes, but by providing a solution that allows people to thrive within the uncertainty of climate change. People are now thinking that this is something that can really happen and it's something that can benefit the community. If we can teach the people to do this themselves, then there's no limit to the number of people who can benefit. Five, two, four, six, eight. We should all amphibiate. The Ganges Delta Floating Home Project has similar elements with the Mekong Delta effort, but it takes a much different approach. It uses a community-led participatory process to design a uniquely sustainable home that floats when the annual monsoons come and provides everything a family needs to live through a flood. The Ganges Delta of Bangladesh is a vibrant and very busy place. It is also one of the most densely populated regions in the world. Unfortunately, it is highly exposed to monsoon flooding, which causes great loss and damage to people. South of Dhaka, in the Delta, Breck University and its partners is co-developing with local communities a new type of flood-resilient habitat that is more than just your average home. A house consists of few structural elements, like a house is built on beams, columns, and roofs. But a home consists of many intangible issues, including, uh, including dreams, including love, including the time we spend with our kids. So we use the term home as a platform to address a wide range of vulnerability issues. For Nandan and his team, the project is built on the principles of sustainability and introduces the concept of home as a platform to build resilience. We propose that we can build a house that would float with water and then it will settle back on the ground as the flood moves away. It is a community driven initiative, but we have facilitated everything. So we have identified the most needy persons from this area and they would be the beneficiary. Matt Unasa works as a seasonal chili picker and raises a grandson. She has lived with floods all of her life. When the rainy season water comes, she lives mostly on her platform bed. Once the sustainable homes are completed, Amat and her grandson will be among the first villagers to move in. Through a series of surveys and training workshops, Nandan and his team, along with the community, designed three experimental flood-resilient homes capable of providing social, food, water, and energy security to local vulnerable families. Together, they came up with a remarkable house plan. We followed the Advastu principle strictly because this project is about sustainability. So natural ventilation, natural light is the most important and integral part of this project. So if we move to the courtyard area, this is the courtyard from that core zone, access to every room 
every part of the house is possible. The master bedroom, the child bedroom, and kitchen, uh, poultry. The homes are mostly constructed of bamboo because it's locally available, inexpensive, and lasts for more than 20 years when treated. Buoyancy to float the homes during floods is provided by recycled plastic barrels from the garment industry. The community told us that we didn't know how to produce crops during flood, but we can't stop eating food during flood. So food is quite critical. You can live here, at the same time you can grow your own food. Vertical and horizontal hydroponic systems can grow more than 3,000 crops, while an aquaponic system can provide fish to eat and nutrient-rich wastewater to grow yet more crops. A chicken coop delivers eggs on a daily basis, which not only provides a livelihood option, but helps the residents achieve a nutritional balance as well. Other innovations include a rainwater harvesting system, solar panels, and windmills to lift water into the water tower. At the request of the community's children, even a special play zone is created in the attic where they can play in private while they wait for dry land to return. We did a trick here. We put the opening in such a way that children can have easily access to that play zone. If adults go there, they have to, uh, they have to uh, careful about their bumping into the roof. <laughs> but for Nanda and his team, designing and building these homes isn't without its problems. One of the challenges that we had faced with the community was that we had to build the feeling of ownership towards this project. When they saw that through this house, they can get everything that they require, they were, they were convinced and they were all in. For next steps, when the three homes are finished, the plan is to hand them over to a community group fully trained on how to operate and replicate their sustainable elements. The local government is also positive about villagers embracing the flood resistant homes. We have shown that this works, that it does not need any imported material, that this can be done by the local masons and local technical people. If we get support to upscale, I'm sure we'll be able to influence policymakers in Bangladesh, and I'm sure this can be adapted. What we have learned is resilience is not a function of hazard only. If you just solve the problem with the hazard, it doesn't bring you resilience. Resilience is a holistic picture of safety, security, governance, and many other development dimensions. The community now starts believing that, yes, living with flood in a sustainable manner, in a resilient manner, is very much possible. Okay, that was Vietnam and uh, Bangladesh, the Ganges in uh, Bangladesh and the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. Um, just some quick rules. Um, we're going to give Elizabeth and Nandan uh, about five, six minutes each to sort of bring us up to date where they are with their projects. Uh, and we will be asking them questions. Uh, it'll be Nate, Andy, and Quinton, plus myself, um, will be asking questions. 
the audience, if you have questions, uh, can you please use the chat? And um, I, can, I see that we have quite a number of questions already. Um, okay, so Elizabeth, are you there? Yes, Hello, I'm here. Elizabeth. I'm here. I'm here. I don't, I don't see you. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so let's start with you. And um, my question to you is, well, I left you in the Delta, the Mekong Delta. Uh, I think it was in September, maybe. And you had just finished working on the um, retrofitting your, uh, your, your houses, and you were waiting for the rains to come. So Tell us what happened. Did they float? Were people happy? Did they work? Uh, and 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 where is the project today? You have uh, five minutes. Okay. So take it away. So it was the beginning. And maybe, of... maybe a little more. Thank you. Thank Go ahead. You. Can everyone hear me? Um, it was the beginning. Go ahead. It was the beginning of July in 2018 when Douglas came and um, uh, made this film with us and uh, <clears throat> the monsoon season starts, uh, well, it's just starting, the rainy season is just starting then, but the floods usually come between September and November. And so sure enough, um, luckily for us, for our documentation, there was a major flood in 2018 and all four of the houses floated and I had an opportunity to go back um, the beginning of October to see them and document them. Um, and then in November, I was entering a, um, an international uh, design competition um, uh, with the Vietnam project in, in, in which we won third place. And so this is a little, uh, uh, three minute film that my students and I made for that design competition. And you'll see a little bit of repetition because Douglas and I shared material here, but uh, let me show this to you now. In, Elizabeth, before yeah. you get going, uh, let me just point out to everybody that um, there's some wonderful drone footage here that actually really sort of shows uh, these houses in situ. So go ahead. Okay. Show your, show the film, show the stuff. Yes, so here we go, sharing screen. Um, okay. Uh, here we go. This project has been a collaboration between our Canadian and Vietnamese partners. It transfers an innovative flood risk reduction and climate change adaptation technology developed in North America for application in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. In September 2018, the Mekong Delta's seasonal flood returned into the rice fields. Along with the rising water levels, four houses put to the test a low-cost system for increasing community resilience and successfully adapted to the flooding. Vietnam's Mekong Delta is home to 17 million people. The Delta is comprised largely of wetlands and is considered the rice bowl of Southeast Asia. Traditionally, houses in the region are raised above ground to mitigate property damage during flooding events. Due to the combination of climate change, weather events, and upstream dam constructions, the current level of static elevation of these houses is no longer adequate to protect residents and their property from flood damage. Low-cost amphibious retrofits to the existing houses can provide a solution to these vulnerable populations. In order to preserve residents' connection to their land and livelihoods, a passive climate change adaptation and flood mitigation technique can be implemented, allowing the agricultural land in the Delta to benefit from the seasonal flooding without endangering residents or inflicting property damage. The project sites are located in the Angyang province and the Long An province. The first site in Angyang province is located in the floating rice conservation area it is home to many farmers and diverse ecologies. Our experiences in the Angyang province allowed us to develop our collaborative process. Design details were developed with models and working drawings in Canada and were merged with local techniques on site during construction. Materials were chosen based on suggestions and consultations with carpenters, homeowners, and local researchers and experts with an emphasis on using recycled materials. 
variations of systems were developed on both sites in order to test different approaches of amphibious retrofits. The second site is in Long San Wetland Reserve in Long An Province. Our work there followed the retrofits in Angyang Province by a few weeks, allowing us to learn from that experience and incorporate improvements into the later retrofits. We were careful to maintain contact with homeowners before, during, and after the retrofit to monitor their experiences and satisfaction with the performance of their retrofitted house. Amphibious homes allow people to adapt gradually to inevitable changes in lifestyle and to avoid displacement and trauma as a result of sudden, unexpected, disastrous events due to worsened flooding from climate change. We aim to expand our scope by teaching local populations how to implement this technology themselves using affordable, locally available materials. We will have succeeded in this goal when the communities we serve can carry on independently without our help. This project builds on the work of the Boyan Foundation Project at the University of Waterloo and is supported by a generous grant from the Global Resilience Partnership and the Z Zurich Foundation. Um, okay, I'm going to stop here for just a second because um, that prepared video is finished and going to go uh, show a little bit more of the um, flooding uh, 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 footage, drone footage and some uh, uh, other videos of the four houses um, when they're flooded. So this is just a little bit more showing um, how they how they managed. So this is um, moving over. You can see the extent of the flooding, and um, uh, we're moving over. The in the lower left corner is the um, uh, the house belonging to now. So we're showing Nao's house first. So here it is floating and uh, we have about a meter and a half of water here. And then close by is uh, Nao's younger brother, Lack's house. This is Lack's house. Um, and there's Lack sitting in the hammock on his front porch. And you can see the sleeves. Uh, this is a different type of sleeve. We used rope on, on uh, Nang's house, and uh, uh, Nao's house and um, boxes on Lack's house. And now we've gone to um, Long Am province. And uh, this is the house that was mostly thatch when we retrofitted it, but the owners um, uh, upgraded it. And this is uh, Nang's house. And there is a monkey bridge. Oh, those are the barrels that are used for um, uh, buoyancy. And this is a monkey bridge on top of the path. So here you can see we used the box type of sleeves um, again. So the existing path is is underwater. So the villagers built a uh, monkey bridge. And uh, here are some of the local children playing in the water. And um, this is the end of my video. Um, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll wait for some questions. This project has Oops. been a collaboration between our community. Let me stop sharing. Okay. Okay. Uh, Quentin, Andy, uh, why don't you, Quentin, do you have any questions for Elizabeth? And then Andy. Hello, Quentin, are you there? No, uh, Quentin has left for the vaccine. Oh. Ah, okay, okay. Quentin had to go off and get his uh, vac uh, vaccination, which is great. Uh, Andy, are you around? I am here. Yeah. What I'm seeing in the in the chat window are questions about cost, uh, specifically for the the Vietnamese example, and then also questions about uh, what about human waste during the flood season. Okay, those are both excellent questions. Um, these uh, four prototypes in Vietnam were the first time that I had tried to build these 
um, except as a university prototype project on a, on a much reduced scale. So um, it was much more expensive than it would be when we have economy of scale and we have a trained crew. No one had ever done this before. We had to pay a lot for materials because we ordered them at the last minute and then had to pay for transportation. So each of these houses cost about uh, $2,400 to retrofit. But when we have the uh, homeowners and, uh, and their neighbors providing the labor and they can uh, collect the materials um, uh, over time and not have to pay a lot for transportation, um, then we believe that the cost and, 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 uh, and, and we've had more time to do some training there, we believe the cost can come down to about $800 per house. Most of that is for the buoyancy elements, the barrels or the jugs. And my goal would be to show people that they can actually take plastic water bottles, put the caps back on, bundle them together and use those for the buoyancy elements. And then the buoyancy elements would be essentially free and um, that would bring the cost down even more. Um, sanitary question. Um, none of these houses had sanitary facilities within the house. Um, there was uh, either a, a, a communal bathroom for the, uh, uh, for the residents um, or they used the traditional Vietnamese waste disposal. Um, uh, so we did not attempt to make an improvement there uh, because that's another whole project. But we do, I am working with some people who are developing that sort of thing. And I'm hoping that in scaling up, we would be able to um, introduce some ways of dealing with human waste. Thank you. Okay, oh. yeah, go ahead, Andy, go ahead. Well, I just Sorry. noticed a, a question about what's the current situation uh, in, the other, in the other river delta. And how, how is that progressing? And what's the, what's the current situation there? And s similar questions. Okay. Nanda, well, that, Nanda? Uh, oh. just, yeah, I, I was just trying to unmute them a couple. Um, so uh, with the Global Resilience um, Partnership funding, uh, the first flood resilient home design work started in 2017 and uh, the movie of which you have already seen. Honestly, until we built the houses, it would be hard for everyone to believe that this idea would work. But we sincerely believe that conventional disaster management solutions reduce risk in the short term, but do not guarantee long-term sustainable development. Uh, for example, if a dam is built aside a river, or if people are taken to a shelter to avoid cyclonic storm surge, uh, do those interventions provide long-term security? The answer is uh, no. What happened to their livelihood at the time during flood or how do they buy food? This question also remains whether a uh, family has to take out loan to avert the loss and damage. Uh, the burden of loans sometimes have to be borne for a long period of time. So what happened to the loss of the home or loss of living and material assets that cannot be moved to the shelter? So to answer all these questions, if we just uh, take the help of academic jargons, then reducing risk, risk exposure doesn't mitigate the vulnerability. Instead, sometimes it often increases that as well. So we were looking for solutions that would address the multiple risk drivers at the family level. Therefore, three homes built in Shoryatpur demonstrated the concept of sustainable living. For instance, the house would be safe during flood and storm. Drinking water would not be a problem. Food and nutritional security would be guaranteed. And the family members would have access to the basic lifeline services, including energy. So at the end of the day, the target was the households would not be harmed in any way, and their condition will remain unchanged during when the disaster is over. That is called resilience, right? The positive outcome were the co-design approach worked perfectly. The structural design worked well. The house was flooded with all its, its features for two years in a row. Nothing happened in big storms sustainable income, energy, water, all components worked without flaw. What didn't work, 
and which is very important. The house drew massive tourist and media attention. In the video, you saw that thousands of people come to see every day. So some of the locals became very greedy. Obviously, some of the uh, powerful people became very greedy and with the help of some influential corrupted political leaders, they took possession of the house and then started selling the expensive part of the house like solar panels, uh, digesters like that. And two years later, the house was completely demolished. A very, a very few influential people drove away from the powerless families for whom the house was designed. Who was wrong? Mainly us, because we wanted to be rebellious and make transformative social changes. We thought that if people were empowered, that means those families were empowered, they could fight against this injustice. No, we were wrong because these fa three families couldn't break or change such an extensive corrupt socio-political system. We suffered a lot, but we learned more. In the meantime, our idea received the United Nations Risk Award. The Times Higher Education gave our research a special commendation in, as recognition uh, in the best research in arts and social science category. Our UK newspaper recognized me as one of the top 100 influential persons for global change and so on. But we didn't have time to fly in the sky because we know that the journey has not ended. In the meantime, we decided to spend the 100,000 euros received at the risk award for the new design uh, by correcting the previous mistakes. We moved to the coastal region of Bangladesh. Architects, energy experts, engineers from all around the world joined my team at this time because I was famous by then. But this time we didn't start with the plan to build a house. We thought social change is needed. First, a radical change in people's mentality is the only thing that can be done and that is mostly needed. This time we chose a school children as our clients. We started to specialize. The idea of sustainability must be spread in society to the new generation. When school children will see their school floating in flood water can stand against big storms or earthquake their school provides healthy food every day, which is produced inside their school. Free and safe drinking water from rain stored in their school premise. All the waste generated in their school is converted into energy. There is no need of for air conditioning in the school, naturally very comfortable. And the salary and maintenance cost of all the staffs of the school can come from the produce of that school. Then they will start believing this concept of sustainability. They will motivate their parents to build their own home using the sustainability principles we practice. Over the years, our team improved our understanding of the differences between a home and a house, but it cannot be measured. In our understanding, H stands for happiness, O stands for ownership, M stands for magnificent, and E stands for empathy. When all these com components are in symbiosis, the design of the homes becomes meaningful. That's what we are trying to do now. Our school design is now underway. Hopefully by the end of this month, it will be finished. Moreover, we have designed a single home that can be found for only 1200 US dollars worldwide because climate change is not a local issue. Mm -hmm. Global and homelessness is a fundamental human right all over the world. We are also planning to implement this concept in other sectors and areas. For instance, in conflict from regions like Rohingya refugees from Myanmar is displaced in Bangladesh. While living in a world of pandemic, we believe even more now that sustainable living is the future. Nathan, excuse me, yeah. excuse me. Hold, we want to I, we, let's get back to uh, Vietnam and then we'll uh, we'll take a look at what's happening in Bangladesh because it's very exciting to hear how you've moved the project on. Um, Andy, you have you have some questions for Tang and 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 let's get. Tang's point of view in here, uh, as she is um, a local, more or less. Um, Andy, are you around? Hello? Yes. Yes. Well, okay. I, th I thought it was very interesting what, what Nanan was saying, speaking about these things from a systems, a, a whole systems perspective. And, and so this is my question for our, our experts from or working in, in Vietnam. Projections mm. for, the, for the Mekong Delta uh, between 2050 and 2100 are that uh, a majority of that land area could be permanently flooded by a combination of sea level rise and land subsidence uh, for, for, for a number of, from a number of, of causes. And so that means that uh, 
not only do they need housing, they're, they're going to have to transform their livelihoods, what they're growing. The, the water will be saltier. There could be permanent flooding happening. Uh, Nanda mentioned the education system, fresh water, food sources are going to change. And then there's also the issue of human waste disposal and, uh, and then household and, and what you might call municipal waste, you know, other, other types of, of waste management. And so I, I guess I'm curious how, how that might be addressed or how that's being thought about um, in the projects in Vietnam to, to deal with those situations that are likely to occur within, you know, 2050 is, is 30 years away. How, how, are these, how are these projects going to apply to, uh, to that level of change that's anticipated in the next uh, 30 to 70 years? Kang, would you like to start and then I'll add something? Uh, thank you so much, Andy, for the uh, question. So uh, you are very right that uh, the situation in the Mekong Delta of Vietnam is getting more and more complicated and there are a lot of uncertainties that uh, we are not sure how to deal with in the future. So all of the issues that you have just listed, like uh, salinization, uh, uh, subsidence, land subsidence, and uh, more ice streams will be uh, probably happening in the Mekong Delta of Vietnam. And that is a really, you know, very complicated situation and uh, wicked issues that uh, many people, uh, the local government experts and local communities are trying to deal with here in the um, Mekong Delta of Vietnam. So, uh, okay, so to answer the question, how the amphibious housing uh, model could help Vietnam to uh, deal with uh, this complicated uh, situation in the future. Uh, one characteristic of the flooding in the Mekong Delta of Vietnam is uh, the flood is calm and prolonged. And so it comes slowly and then withdraws slowly. So uh, this characteristic is very suitable for the type of hemp-based housing design that have been uh, applying in the Mekong Delta of Vietnam. Uh, so that is uh, the first thing that uh, for me to, to think that uh, the amphibious housing model is very suitable for the flooding characteristics in the condition of the Vietnamese Mekong Delta. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, the Vietnamese government uh, has recognized uh, the uncertainties, the complicated situations in the Vietnamese Mekong Delta, especially uh, given the uh, climate change and sea level rise in the future. So uh, the government is uh, steering the Delta in a more sustainable development uh, uh, direction in the future. It means that uh, we are trying to adapt to the nature, to live with flood. So the amphibious housing design, I think is in line with the direction of the local government uh, for a, a sustainable development of the Mekong Delta in the future. Uh, yeah, so uh, if that answers the question, uh, maybe Elizabeth, if you could ask, add something. Yeah. I'd, I'd like you. to add another couple of points. Um, with respect to the short window between now and uh, when we might start seeing the Mekong Delta go underwater. Um, in the first place, uh, if your house is amphibious, then you don't lose everything when there's a flood. So a flood comes and your house goes up and even if you evacuate, you can move right back in um, afterwards without any damage to your possessions. Um, so this gives people a lot more flexibility. They don't move because they've been wiped out. Uh, they move because they've gotten to the point where it's no longer convenient enough or they're no longer able to uh, produce a livelihood. But these people are incredibly ingenious. They already multi-crop in the floating rice district. 
Um, and when the fields are flooded, they all become fishermen. So they, they fish when the water's there. Uh, in, uh, in, in some parts of Vietnam, they triple crop, and that's not what we're talking about here uh, because that degrades the land. But the amphibious houses would be part of a system that respected the land, respected the water, and allowed the, uh, the farmers to continue to do crop rotations and develop new uh, 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 or, or, or uh, uh, produce new crops uh, that as the climate changes, uh, more salt resistant uh, uh, varieties of rice and the um, other crops that they grow, but they're already uh, rotating crops in the in Anjiang. Um, yeah, and the the other thing is that the people learn to do learn how to do this themselves. There was a another question about cost, if you don't mind my answering that here. Um, but uh, when when they're able to control the uh, purchasing of materials, when they're able to provide the labor, um, then all they need to pay for is um, the time of the master carpenter and uh, what's left of the materials that they need to buy. I say what's left because they can make the buoyancy elements themselves uh, from plastic water bottles that they don't have to pay for. And the other thing is that we were talking with the government, um, the local government about developing plans for them to uh, subsidize the purchase of materials or work with local businesses to uh, create subsidies so that people could buy the materials um, at much lower cost. And honestly, I think the national government, when they see how this increases the resilience of the people and how invested in this the people are themselves, because it's a retrofit to their own house. So they already have a stake in maintaining it and making sure that uh, they're checking it all the time. And anyway, I'll stop there, uh, but... Um, okay. Elizabeth, I, I, let me jump in here. I, I'm very curious, did, did the people really sort of like what you did for them? I mean, were they happy with, you know, their house went up and the whole thing floated and they were fine with this and loved they, it, they, I gather. They, they were ecstatic. We okay. were there in October and when it was flooding and they were delighted with it. And then I also made a trip back in January um, uh, after the flood uh, with Tang and we interviewed the, the owners and asked them about mm -hmm. their experience and they loved it. They said, this is so fantastic. We're not afraid of the flood anymore. Okay. And what did the local officials think? Because when, when we went and we talked to them, it was very clear they were keeping an eye on you. And is this, you know, are these people crazy? Will this work? Can we get this to, is this something we want to do? So I'm, I'm not unaccustomed to being characterized as crazy for being so engaged in, um, in this project. But they, they, they were very skeptical when we were there in um, May, June, July of 2018. But then the floods came and the houses all worked beautifully. And the government officials came, they were delighted. Um, I had had quite a few meetings when I went back in January and um, uh, uh, they wanted to keep this going. They wanted to uh, uh, perpetuate it and be a part of it. Um, but I ran out of funding and um, mm -hmm. I, unfortunately, I've transferred a lot of knowledge to the a master carpenter, but not enough yet for him to work on this in, himself. And there's some tricky things having to do with buoyant stability that I need to, um, uh, I, 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 I need to give them better guidelines so that they can okay. do it themselves. Okay, Liz, I, I, I'm sorry, but we're sort of running out of time and we want to get to Nanda and, and hear all about his wonderful project. Uh, my last question would be for Tang. Tang, are you there? 
Uh, from a from a Vietnamese point of view, what do you think of this whole thing of retrofitting the houses and they float? Do you think this is something you can sell to everybody? Tang? Hello? Um, hello, can you hear me? Hello, okay, yeah. So what do you think? I think the model is very suitable for uh, the situation of the Vietnamese Mekong Delta and especially for the low income uh, communities, because as Elizabeth already explained, we can use recycled materials and also the materials that we can find uh, in the local areas. So that the cost of the houses will be affordable for the local communities. And secondly, so uh, you know, the local carpenters, they learn uh, the techniques from Elizabeth and the group so that uh, it can be a new livelihood for these carpenters to uh, further uh, develop and then to train for the new carpenters in the Mekong Delta to develop. And uh, I would oh. like to... Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Andy. Any uh, any last question for the Vietnamese team before we um, before we go to switch to Bangladesh? I, I don't have a question. I might have a comment later if we have time. Okay. Okay. I'd like Is to there hear. anything in the list that one? La okay, one last question for Vietnam. Anything that we can see that we can do quickly? Um, I think most of the questions okay. were addressed directly or okay. indirectly that we've seen so far. Yes. Okay, Nandan, are you there? Or you're still there, I hope. Yes, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> okay, so uh, the last time I saw you and I left you on the, on the, in the Delta, in the Ganges, and you were about 30 days, 30, maybe 40 days away from turning over those houses to the constituents. All those people that were lining up to look at your work. So tell us, what happened? Uh, and, and I did hear you say that, the, that they went through two floods. So let's hear about that. And then tell us how it's evolved so that you are basically down the street from Cox's Bazaar, which is very interesting. You've moved yeah. the whole thing over. <laughs> so, tell, you know, what happened? It's, Actually, what happened, well, what you saw, I can well remember that when you were documenting in Wadi Vidding, when we are handing over the project to the local community, we created a, a music festival. We uh, arranged a music festival, and there are more than five thousand people joined on that evening. That was a huge crowd. Wow. And after that, actually, that didn't stop. Every day, it would be like more than five to five hundred to one thousand people uh, want to visit the, uh, want to see what happens, and they want to uh, get over the house. So that was a big issue, and that became a tourist spot for like people who are traveling from like 100 kilometers. And that created the initial problems that some of the people get very greedy, local people, they found some tourist business opportunities. And they finally, what happened with the help of some political leaders, they actually abandoned the house and start stealing. And after some two years, they started stealing the solar panels and uh, other things. So what we learned from that project was very important. That was very sad incident for me because I, I was the designer, I built it and uh, they uh, abandoned that, abolished that house. So I was like literally in shock. But what happened, I started learning that, okay, probably we did something wrong. We, we did not expect that it would happen. We thought that, okay, uh, it would be, uh, 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 if we can empower these families, they will be able to fight, which didn't work. So after getting the risk award, we invested all the money for a new project. But this time, it's not a home, it's a school. And I already told you why I chose to put the, it's a, a, one of the vulnerable offshore islands. And we thought that this time, uh, instead of building anything, we are going to uh, think about the future, like how to spread this message, how to build this kind of houses, how they can um, grow crops in this kind of houses or like that. So this time we have decided to uh, design a school and we use the same co-design approach, but this time more extensively. Uh, our, our colleagues are living on that island for years now. 
So uh, yeah, this is uh, quite good. And uh, if I get chance, I'll show you a very small work in progress documentary from Kutubdia. Okay, do you wanna, Nandan, do you wanna sort of get into that? Show us what's the new yeah. location and, and what are you planning to build? I mean, you, there, there's some sketches of the new housing, yes. housing so, that you're, you're developing. Yeah, okay. I, if you so, give me permission to share my screen because uh, my version has the caption in it and I found that the one I sent <laughs> okay. to you earlier doesn't have caption. So uh, uh, I don't know whether, uh, uh, okay, I, I, I don't think it would be a good idea because I can't find that option here. So um, <laughs> you, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Uh, it's okay. Uh, yeah. Give me, give me a second. All right, so we'll I, might, I might be able to, okay, go ahead. I might be able to give you permission to do that. Okay, that would be great. So try, try now and see if you can share your screen. Uh, text or, okay, I'll, uh, no, it's, it's preventing me to share. I don't know why. Hmm. Uh, it's say, say, saying uh, system uh, permissions or something. Uh, so yeah, uh, I, I think okay. we have to go for plan B. Spencer, right. Spencer, can you can you can you play Nandan's film? Yes, let me let me uh, share it from my my end. Okay. Oops. Oh, sorry. Let me try again.
Okay. Nandan, can you tell us what we just saw? Give us a give us the overview. Yeah, uh, I just in the first few slides I show that. Uh, sorry, microphone. Sorry, 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 sorry. Microphone is turned on, but uh, can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. To your mouth. Okay. So yeah, um, Kutubdia is a very vulnerable island because uh, of storm surge and sea level rise. Rising sea level has already engulfed a part of the uh, island. And this island doesn't have uh, grid electricity. The only wind power plant in Bangladesh is located in Kutubdia, but that can only power for four hours and only a very small part of the island. So, uh, and um, uh, the school children are um, not getting proper education because there is not enough school. And, but the important part is the peoples are very friendly and they want to learn and especially the children. So that's why this is one of the reason why we thought that we are going to move to Kutubdia and, uh, and try to develop an education center where all these technologies will be demonstrated and they will leave us with those technologies. And in the future, they will be able to motivate their parents that, okay, uh, we know what is sustainable living. Let's build our home using this technology. So this time um, we are planning for a bigger future and not some discrete interventions uh, in among three households or like what we did in Shoresput. Yeah. It's difficult. Okay. Working from Kutubia yeah. is really very difficult, but uh, it's worth spending. Did, did you say, uh, did you tell me that you had somebody from the field that's on the line waiting to talk to us? Uh, would, you, would you like to, um, are they yes, here? Yes. Would you? Yes, they are here. His name is Gregory Shardar. He's the community um, uh, represent, uh, he's the community coordinator from, uh, from on behalf of the team. Uh, Gregory, if you can contribute something, I'll really appreciate that. Hello, Gregory. Hello. Could you introduce yourself? Uh, uh, good evening. I am Gregory Shardar and be half of team resolution solution Kutubdia Bangladesh. I am thankful to every day to allow us to uh, <coughs> present Kutubdia. A beautiful is island. island at the southeastern part of Bangladesh and in the Bay of Bengal. Now we are working in Ali Akbar Deal Union to collect data for his house to understand about these needs. Disaster uh, <coughs> pattern and uh, so socio-economical condition to design and approaches house to save their most uh, vulnerable people. People are uh, deprived of because need like pure drinking water, electricity, education, Shardar and on we found lot of house those cannot even manage three Shardar meals a day. Shardar bhai, I have already covered those parts. Thank you very much. We are very proud to have you here. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh, and we are going to um, hear from you more in the coming days. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, thank you very much, Gregory. Um, thank you. Not done. Why don't you explain a little bit? Okay, well, what are you going to do within the next year? I mean, you had some, you had some construction ready to go. You had the designs for the school. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? 
uh, this time we have got uh, two projects in our hand. One, but from the same funding, we have designed mm -hmm. a school. At the same time, we have designed a twelve hundred dollar house that we want to replicate or replicate the concept of that house all over the globe. Uh, our idea is uh, homelessness is not uh, a privilege. It's a it's a it's a basic human right. So we are going to open these designs so that uh, people from all around the globe can use these designs. So for next year, our project is mass communication of these designs and these principles, number one. Uh, the funding period from the uh, Munich Tree Foundation is uh, going to be stopped this month. So definitely we are looking forward to some other funding options. But uh, as I told you earlier, uh, we are relying more of more reliance on self-sustainability. Like uh, funding comes with many responsibilities. So if we can develop some business models, locally driven business models, like social business, that will not only run their school, but also uh, help in disseminating this kind of concepts. So yeah, let's see how it goes on. That's our plan. I have not okay. got any funding yet for uh, constructing the schools or houses, but I'm looking forward to that. Okay, um, Andrew, any questions for Nanda? And, uh, and Nate, I was also thinking, um, why don't you ask that very interesting question about uh, of yours about um, standalone solutions are often not effective against the dynamic challenges of climate change um, and see whether Elizabeth and Nandan could, um, could uh, answer that. But uh, let me ask, Andy, do you have any, anything to, any questions to ask Nandan? Uh, that would be my question, the one that you just uh, asked Nate to ask. <laughs> so I think we'll let him ask it. <laughs> Okay, well, why don't we, why don't, why don't you read that question? I mean, did you, did you get a copy of that? Okay. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't have the exact question in front of me, but I might be able to just uh, to, to wing it based off of um, the fact that I probably, I wrote it before. So, but I mean, I think right. just, you know, when you have these challenges of climate change, they're, they're obviously linked uh, across uh, a number of other factors. So it's not just the, the floods that, that are the challenge here, it's the interlinked risks and almost a, an architecture of risks that connects these these um, these events and these pressures that people are facing, especially vulnerable um, or people that are vulnerable to shocks and stresses. So it'd be great to see, you know, how how you've dealt with those. Um, and really, as I sort of as I said in my intro, um, looked at this as beyond just a, a simple, uh, you know, a technological solution to a much more sort of uh, approach that you, you do to address the, the challenges of climate change. Um, so shall I respond, Douglas? Yes, uh, no, yes. go ahead, uh, please. Uh, we can't agree more with Nate's comment because uh, I, I, I'll consider this question in two parts. One first part is comment. Yes, we ag agree that stand on sol stand alone solutions are not sufficient. That's why, uh, that's why embankments or uh, risk or traditional engineering solutions like embankments or drainage solutions doesn't does come with many environmental impacts and many things. That has also has happened in the Shuriatpur case. But having said that, we need to proofread. We need the uh, proof of the concept. It has to be started somewhere by building this because when it was in in the concept mode, even our colleagues at the university didn't believe on us. So the Shoryatpur initiative was the proof of the concept where we got, uh, where we could demonstrate that uh, structure to uh, wider communities. I can tell you something, the two minute photo story clip that we prepared, it was viewed 7 million times in the social media. So that message spread so fast because something was there. That came with some failures, but we also believe that infrastructure based solutions is less effective than societal resilience. And this time we are not doing that mistake. We are targeting for social societal re resilience and more on disseminating that knowledge, 
transferring the technology to the communities, transferring those technologies to the youngest member of the societies. Thank you. Okay, Elizabeth. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So um, I, I completely agree that uh, interventions can't be just on their own. They need to fit into a system. They need to, somebody, somebody when you put them on the ground, somebody needs to own them and uh, care about them and keep them going. And so retrofitting um, a small house that belongs to a family, um, in the first place, we have the owners who have bought into this. And when they are more engaged in the actual building and they're contributing the labor, they will be even more bought in than they were for this demo project. Um, but uh, the, the, the intervention is, is small um, and can happen in many different places. It's inexpensive and we have ways of, it's, it's too expensive now, uh, but we have ways of bringing the cost down. Um, the government has expressed interest in getting involved in this. Um, but it just, uh, it, it needs a little more field work on my part to be there to help uh, push this forward and make it happen and also do more training for the carpenters. Um, and the other thing is that we had the opportunity to work in Vietnam and that was fabulous and I, des I, I, I definitely want to go back to Vietnam and scale this up there, but it could also work in Bangladesh, it could work in India, it could work in Cambodia, it could work in Thailand. So there are many, many places where uh, this could be applied and um, uh, at the scale and cost that it is, um, I, I think it's uh, uh, very broadly applicable. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I want to see whether Tang could give us some thoughts on uh, Nate's question. Tang, are you, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please uh, share with us your thinking. Yes, so um, when listening to Nandan and uh, Elizabeth, I think about the flooding series happened in the center of Vietnam last year, which caused uh, hundreds of uh, people died and many billions and many schools were damaged. And so the flooding series happened uh, suddenly and lots of people were put in passive situations where they didn't expect the flood was so big in the magnitude like that. So I was thinking if we have some sort of uh, uh, like the amphibious houses for the local people there, then those houses could save a lot of lives and properties for local people. So I think in the condition of uncertainty happening in many countries in over the world, especially uh, for vulnerable communities, one suitable and affordable uh, model like the housing amphibious, uh, like the amphibious houses could, uh, should be expanded and um, yeah, to apply more, to develop more in over the world. Okay, thank you, Tang. Thank you. Um, uh, Spencer, I, I guess I can turn things back to you, but we have about four or five minutes. Shall we open this up to the, uh, if anybody is interested in asking our panel uh, or anybody a question? Shall we do that, Spencer? Yes. Um... No, thank you, Doug. Let me uh, first thank um, you know, all the facilitators and GRPs and uh, Nate and in supporting this event, all the uh, Rotarian participants in here. I think this is a very important uh, topic we need to address um, because uh, we all know that peace is not just the absence of war. The, the, um, some, the attending the events at the GRPs has uh, shown us that um, the climate changes is real. You know, is and then we need to find innovative solution to address the resilience. And together with the Rotarians uh, community, I think we can uh, bring some solutions into the pictures. Uh, maybe what we can do is that we still have a few minutes in here. If there is any burning comments or 
questions from the from the floor, from the chairians, from, from the groups, please feel free um, to raise their hand or actually to comment. Another thing that I come across is, I mean, these things is not only happening in the developing world. We have, you know, United States, Louisiana, everywhere is happening around the world. So, um, yeah, feel free if you have any comments. Andy, do you have any comments? One final what's, comment. One final. Sure. What, what's coming to my mind as a as a peace fellow, as a peace builder, and, and being educated as a systems ecologist, for those of us living in uh, wealthier countries or in areas that are not particularly prone to flooding or sea level rise, um, I guess I'd like to remind us that uh, part for me, the part of the importance of this, whether they're 100% effective for everyone or 50% effective, um, it doesn't matter. It's, it's providing uh, a cushion to the changes that are going to happen. So, so communities will adapt uh, to the extent that they can typically. And when the rate of change exceeds their, the rate of their ability to adapt, that's where we have problems. We look at the conflict in Syria, for example, if we dig down into the root of that, there's, there's quite a deep and broad root in, in water issues behind that conflict. So in, in the case in, in Southeast Asia, we have maybe an overabundance of water in some cases. and, and increasing people's ability to uh, spread out the impact of the change in, in water availability over space and time adds to the stability of that region. So I think this is quite important um, work and we, and we, can, we can debate uh, whether it's a solution or a temporary mitigation or how long it's gonna be useful and what else needs to happen at the same time, it's still an important component of that. Um, and it's, to, to, it's important for us to keep in mind that there are other things that are going to need to happen um, as well and pay attention to the whole situation, I think, as uh, people that can affect policy or affect funding and whatnot to keep our eye on the whole picture. That would be my comment. Okay, any response to that? I'm reading my Facebook. Um, um. Yes, yeah. yes, I will. Um, I think there's an interesting aspect of the time scale here. There's, you know, sort of the immediate solution and there's the long term solution and they're not necessarily the same thing. Um, I know that in North America now, both in the United States and in Canada, they are promoting uh, managed retreat, which means people are required to move away when their home has been damaged in a flood um, or else it's just made, they make it so expensive that you can't stay. So people are disenfranchised and have to move. We can't do that in, in, uh, in Southeast Asia. There's too many people. Um, and so a temporary solution that saves these people from um, loss and trauma and forced displacement or pushes them into migration, allows them to stay until they're ready to leave. That's, that's what I, I think we need. I, I said at the beginning that what interested, what got me into this is because um, I was so horrified by the trauma that I witnessed in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, because uh, I was doing a lot of work there um, at, at, after, after Katrina. Um, and you know, it was completely unnecessary. People don't have to suffer in that way. We have ways of protecting people, even if it's just temporarily, but if it's inexpensive and it gives people the opportunity to stay where they are and then have the choice of moving when they can no longer sustain themselves when they're ready to go. And that level of, uh, of, of efficacy, of agency in their own lives is really, really important to me. 
Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. Jeff, I think you have raised your hand and uh, you want to add some comments and uh, yeah, we're running out of a little bit of time. Sure, I was going to try and bring a collaborative common vision or thread of the whole discussion. There's many and various diverse and dynamic points and purposes as well as perspectives that we've shared, seen, heard, felt, and listened to through these projects. And uh, what one that where I'm seeing some overlap is with as a social or human species is these projects were motivated by each other more often or more frequently than viruses or the fish and grains that we are attracted to and or repelled from. Like why we live in these places to begin with. They aren't always choice often circumstantial. And uh, I saw some of the consequences or effect from the one example, while more recently active in multidisciplinary indexes of well-being and poverty or happiness and illness. And uh, I think there's a lot of smaller subjects and integral points that are being addressed here as human beings living in a common world with a limited earth of resources of a very dynamic and active systems and processes. Thank you each. It's nice to learn and listen with you as a candidate applicant. Thank you, thank you. Well, we're over time. So Spencer, what do you... Yes, thank you, Doc. I and leave it in your capable hands. Thank you, thank you. Let me again thank you, Nate, um, the um, Global Resilient Partnerships for sponsoring, supporting this event. And thank you, Elizabeth and Nathan, for sharing your experience as well as Tang, and your local experience in, in the Vietnam in here. And thank you, Andrews and Doug, to moderating and facilitating these events. Um, the Rotary Peace Fellowships uh, Alumni Associations and is a group of people that um, focus on peace buildings and together the Rotarians community would like to um, you know, work together and addressing these very, very important um, issues. Uh, again, let me draw you the attentions of that. Um, the, the association is, uh, will be hosting the, um, the Global Peace Conference in coming June, in mid-June, and we'll bring in other topics in addition with environments, uh, gender equalities, and different topics in here. And we're encouraging the authoritarians and the participants here to join us and share your thoughts and hopefully we can find solutions working together collaboratively in finding a possible solutions for mankind. Again, thank you very much for attending the event. And I look forward to seeing all you um, in future in the event. Uh, recording will be shared um, through emails um, when they are available on the website. Thank you and um, have a great evening or have a great day and a great weekend. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a nice Thank you. Evening. Thank you, Tang. I'm so glad you can make it. Great. Elizabeth. Thank you, everyone. I enjoyed the question. I've put quite a bit in the chat. So um, take a look at that. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot now. We'll continue this discussion. Please, yes. Let's do that. Let's do that. Okay, bye bye now. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Bye bye. Jean Louis, nice bye. to meet you. <laughs> look at the, oh, gee, look at the, what I posted. I just yes. posted on the chat, please. Okay, we'll do. Okay, thank please you. Please contact me and, uh, okay, we can talk about it later. All right. Yes, thank you. Bye bye. bye. See you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. That was so great. Super. Glad you enjoyed it. Oh, yeah, I did. Bye. Bye bye Andy, now. Andy, it's a real pleasure to meet you. Oh, thank uh, you. I, I appreciate your answers. They're quite good. Yeah. And I would love to have an opportunity to speak with you further. Okay. Um, can uh, I think, uh, let me see if I have your email already. Um, we may have been on some joint emails. Yes. That's what I'm looking for right now. Okay. What, can you tell me what your email is? And I'll search for it right now. English at ecenglish.ca. English. Oh, I don't have it at ecenglish.ca. Okay. And, and what's yours? 
I'll put it in the I'll put it in the chat. Oh, should fantastic! I, should should I do fantastic. that? Sure. Yeah, I was just I was curious how to. I felt like you know we have all these Rotarians in the room and uh, how how to impress you know I'm getting put on the spot there you know how to impress upon them the importance of of what what all of you all are doing and also not let them think that it's a total solution for everything you know because some people are going to gradually move out of that area and they have to go somewhere right and the agriculture system is going to change and that food has to be replaced somehow you know Vietnamese right. people still need to eat so I don't right. want them to just think that okay we solved it we're done you know right. and, uh, and and leave it at that um, I want them to be excited about what you're doing and support that and also pay attention and be participatory in other things that are going to need to happen at the same time. And I wasn't quite able to grasp yeah. that, you know. Um, anyway, yeah. So, what, what is this uh, Rotarian fellow thing that you have or you do? Uh, so let's see. So Rotary, I'm assuming you know a little bit about Rotary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they also have an international foundation that's kind of technically kind of separate. And somewhere along the line, a bunch of people around the world that were Rotarians that decided they were interested in what they were calling peace building, which is, which is pretty broad. It could be you know, reform of police and military institutions or uh, reconciliation after civil war or genocide, or it could be preventing those kind of things. It could be gender, gender equity uh, issues, all, all manner of, all manner of things. And so they funded, uh, the Rotary Foundation funded uh, partnerships at six or seven universities around the world. And they send about 20, uh, I think about 20 people per year to each of those centers to, to study together. How about I turn off the recording? Okay. I think I can do that.